right? It's not easy. It's simple. It is hard. And it's only hard in the beginning, though. So, guys, if you can gird your loins, and if you don't know what that is, it's a biblical term. Girding your loins means preparing for some hardship. If you can gird your loins and prepare for four to six weeks, would you go through four to six weeks of hardship to change your body like I've done in this picture? Because that's really what it is. And it's not just your body. The body is the thing we all chase because that's what we see every day. It's things you don't even know. And I call it the unknown unknown. What you don't know that you don't know. And once you go down this rabbit hole and you changed, the unknown unknowns are greater than the body change. The body all right, all right, all right. Carnivore Soldier coming at you from Austin, Texas this morning. It's a Saturday morning early, my favorite time to do a recording, and this is my one-year mark. I've been carnivore for over a year now, a year and a day. This is my first day past my one-year mark, and I'm just here to share some thoughts, reflections, hopefully some motivation, share some success stories, some struggles I had, things that I've gone through, and just to keep it real with you. Not everything is always rainbows and puppy dog tails in life, right? And the carnivore diet fixes a lot of things, a lot of things that are wrong in your life, but it doesn't fix everything. But I just want to kind of share like reflections on my journey. And it is a journey and I'm still on it. I'm not, I've not arrived. It's not time to rest on my laurels or to say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm now a successful carnivore or anything like that. This is a journey. I'm continually improving, changing my goals, all that. And I think that this is something we, we definitely need to keep doing. As soon as you stop setting new goals and striving for new things, then you basically become less effective. A Christian guy told me once that as soon as your memories of your past exceed your goals for your future, God has no use for you. Basically, you're just living in the past. And I think I was living in the past a little bit. Once I retired from the military, I wasn't planning for the future. I can put it that way. My life was really just trying to hold what I had as long as I could and hopefully not die too young. Uh, now my life's completely changed. I'm planning for a long future. I'm not even middle-aged yet. <laughs> I turned 58 in uh, May, so it's not too far out. May the 4th be with you. May 4th will be my birthday. Yeah, I've got a long life ahead of me. And I realize that now. And it's like, man, I've got a plan for a long life. <clears throat> I've got a plan for a long life and a lot of things to do. And it's no longer a hold on to what I have. It's more of a, hey, what are we going to expand to? What are we going to do? What's going to be different going forward? Uh, so first off, let me talk about the progress I've had. And I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, share the screen. You, you've already seen the uh, the thumbnail, I'm sure. But I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with my, my recent Facebook post. As you can see, uh, this is the one-year mark. I've gone from 280 pounds to 233 or 232, depending on the day. I put on a lot of lean muscle. Uh, my cardiovascular fitness, everything is better. Nothing has gotten worse. Nothing. Inflammation's gone down. Arthritis basically pretty much gone away. I wake up, I feel great in the morning. I have a pep in my step. I don't need 15 minutes on the couch or sitting there taking an allergy pill and blowing my nose for an hour before I can operate. I just get up and I start doing stuff. And I'm always looking for things to do too. That's completely different. I used to put off a lot of chores, a lot of things. I would sit on the couch and not want to get up. Walking the dog around the block was an imposition. Doing dishes was just like my least favorite thing. Mowing the lawn wasn't something I liked doing. Now, if it's sunny, man, I'll just jump out there. I love being out there. And I'll just mow the front and back lawn and sometimes just take my shirt off and do it and get some sun too. It's It just feels great. I love to walk the dog barefoot now. So I take my dog out, Duke, and I walk him around the block barefoot. Sometimes I walk several blocks barefoot and uh, get some grounding in. And it feels great. I just feel natural. I feel this is the way you're supposed to feel. And yeah, so those are some things that changed. The weight loss is amazing. The only complaint I have is I keep losing waist size. So I keep dropping down sizes and shorts. And I screw up. I just screwed up last time. I bought six pairs of shorts. I shouldn't have. I should have bought two. So if in the future going forward, I'm going to start buying two pairs of shorts at a time and two pairs of pants. And that's it until my waistline just normalizes out and stabilizes, which I think is probably going to be around 
33 inches, maybe 34. I'm about a 35 right now, I think. So I'm very close. And I'm six foot three, or six foot two and a half to six foot three, depending on form of shoes or if I'm uh, barefoot. And at 233 pounds, I'm at my pretty much my college playing weight. Not quite the college fitness level I was at because playing rugby, I was extremely fit. Although I can't imagine what my fitness would have been like had I been on this diet. Instead of eating garbage, mac and cheese and all that stuff that college kids eat on. Now, I did eat a lot of chicken. <clears throat> now, I did eat a lot of chicken, but not much beef. I ate some fish, but I would eat a lot of mac and cheese, a lot of processed foods, a lot of chips and salsa, that kind of stuff when I was in college. Junk, complete junk. And still, I was in great shape. So my body was so resilient. When we're younger, our bodies are so much more resilient. They can handle so much abuse. And even getting older, it's just amazing how much abuse I put my body through now that I understand the mechanics. And this is something I think we need to really grasp onto. You don't have to be an expert of all these things to do carnivore. You don't have to be an expert of how the mitochondria work and you know how seed oils affect your body. And you don't have to be an expert on your insulin levels. And you don't have to be an expert on LDL cholesterol. You don't have to be an expert on these things to follow guidelines and operate your body properly. It's just like you don't have to be a master mechanic to operate your vehicle properly, right? You don't have to understand everything with compression ratios and what viscosity oil you need and how different types of octane in your gas will affect your engine. All you have to do is follow the guidelines. If you follow the guidelines, your vehicle will operate and it will last longer. If you service it regularly, like the manufacturer or the maker says, then you will definitely have a vehicle that lasts a lot longer and performs better. If you run the right fuel in it, if you service it, if you drive it, now if you're an aggressive driver, it's going to wear that vehicle down faster probably than if you're just a moderate driver. Same with your body, right? So uh, if I'm an aggressive athlete, uh, even if I'm doing carnivore, it'll do some wear and tear, which it did. Being in the military and being an athlete, my body got beat up more than someone who wouldn't have had a more sedentary lifestyle. But that being said, I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to know everything to do carnivore successfully, just like you don't have to know everything to drive your vehicle properly and make it last a long time and get the most out of it. So look at it that way. You don't have to, there's no, this. your knowledge base of how these things work in your body should not be a barrier to entry. There should not be a barrier to entry. You should just be able to say, okay, I see it works. I've got doctors telling me the guidelines and what I should be doing, like Dr. Ken Berry saying, hey, eat until uh, you're satiated and listen to your body. You got Dr. Baker writing these great books. You got Dr. Chafee giving you guidelines and writing great books. You know, no, don't eat any sweeteners. Those are just great guidelines. So you can follow those and you don't need to understand well, why can't I eat a sweetener? Well, just just don't do it. I mean, you don't have to, don't worry about why. If you want to find out why, fantastic. Go ahead and learn. This is, a, you know, never a bad thing to increase your knowledge, but don't make it a barrier to entry, right? There should be no real barriers to entry on this diet. And I see it over and over where people do talk about their barriers to entry. Let me go ahead and stop my share here and get back in the big screen so you can see me. These barriers to entry are almost always, almost always self-made. They're self-imposed limitations and they're excuses. I mean, you hear a lot of excuses. You know, well, everyone else in my family doesn't do carnivore. Okay, that works. That'll work. That's a good excuse. You can use that one. Or uh, I, I feel like I need fiber or whatever. There's just so many excuses. Oh, I like my lettuce and I, I can't live without my fruit. Well, that'll work. That That's a good excuse. You know, any excuse you make will work to prevent you from succeeding. So if you want to make excuses, go ahead. You know, there, there, there are excuses everywhere and you can pull one from anywhere to justify your failure or you can just put it away and say, listen, I'm just going to suck this up and I'm going to drive on and I'm going to push through the uncomfortable time. When I did this carnivore diet, a lot of people talk about easing into it. That was not me. I cannot do that. And maybe you can't either. If you're the kind of person that does three days of carnivore and then binges and then does three days of carnivore and binges and you have the same day, uh, you know, doing Groundhog Day over and over and over, um, some people are in that cycle and it's a terrible, painful cycle. It is awful. 
and that's a complete addiction. That's no different than a heroin or cocaine addiction or whatever else addiction you can think of, alcohol. You have to learn how to break it, and breaking it is not easy. So most excuses are tied to, I believe, to addiction and, um, you know, their justification. So some people are not going to be able to ease into this. Like I was not one of those people. I know a lot of people carry from Homestead out, not that kind of person. He had to just burn his bridges, right? As I say, burn the ships. Uh, I had to do the same thing. I'm not a guy who's going to cut back and say, well, I'm just going to eat three Oreos instead of eating a whole bag of them, right? Not going to happen. So when I did it, I basically cut everything out and it was pretty much kind of living hell for a couple of weeks. But listen, that's a small price to pay. And it maybe because I've been through the military and I've done hard things in the military for weeks and months at a time. And you do, you get asked to do really hard things. Maybe that's why I, I don't have a problem doing this. But I think everyone has the capability of doing it. And the rewards are at least a thousand times better than the hardship. At least, maybe 10,000 times better than the hardship on the other end. So I talk about putting a check in escrow, making your why. You need a why, right? Why are you going to go through four weeks of hell or six weeks of hell or three weeks of hell, whatever it is for you? Everyone's body is different. Why are you going to do it? It's got to be more than just losing 13 pounds for spring break, okay? Because that's not a big enough why. And once your why gets big enough, it becomes much easier. And some people, their why gets so big that they start a YouTube channel or start sharing it to other people because it's beyond them now. And now the why has turned into kind of a mission, like my mission carnivore, where you just feel like you need to get this out to other people to help them because it's such a big change in life. Like I said before, this is um, a life-changing event. It's like becoming a father. It's like graduating a military school and becoming a soldier. Your identity actually changes. It changes so many things in your life that you're no longer the same person you were once you've done this successfully for a while. And it changes your worldview. The lens with which you view the world and you, you view things changes. And that's a big deal. That's not like a little thing. It's not like doing Atkins, which I've done in the past, or even doing keto, which I've done in the past. That does not change your worldview. It never didn't for me anyway. I don't know anyone who's ever said it did. It makes you feel great. You lose weight, but not everything changes. And I think when you go carnivore, that brain fog lifts, the fear leaves your body. For me, my fear of getting cancer, fear of getting Alzheimer's, you know, as I continue to educate myself, which again, is not a barrier for entry, but it's something you can do as a, through your progress, you might be interested in why everything's working and you may do some uh, education. And with that, like I said, my fear has left my body. I don't fear dying. I know we're not superhuman. I mean, I can get in a car crash tomorrow and die or on a plane crash or something. This can happen to anyone at any time, but you feel superhuman. You feel like I don't have to fear disease like I used to. And I know that if I do get disease, there's tools for combating it and dealing with it, including cancer and <clears throat> these kind of things. So it's really changed my daily walk, my thought process. It's changed everything. Like I said, I was pretty much just resigned to coasting the rest of my life. Now I'm planning. I'm in a planning phase. I'm planning to travel the world. I'm planning to hopefully one day uh, meet someone special and get married again. I've got a family already, but you know, I've I, uh, my son is, I'm planning to be around for my son for a long time. I'd love to be around for my son, at least till he's my age now. And, you know, after that, well, well done. I've had a good life, you know, um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'll be 58. So he's 14. So that gives me, um, 44 more years from today, which would be up to a hundred years old. If I get over a hundred, I'll be pretty fat, fantastic. And I, I plan to get over a hundred. I plan to get to 110, 120, like Dr. Chafee says. And you have to plan for that just in case it happens, right? Being a plans guy in the military, I like to plan for stuff. Definitely looking forward to that. Some other things that changed. Let's see my optimism. Again, with the absence of fear, optimism and motivation, which I think go hand in hand. I became, I was always a glass half full guy. But I think it's even more so once you get on this way of eating because 
everything just looks different through that lens. Like I said, there's that lens you're looking through, the carnivore lens, and everything looks better. Life looks better. Future looks better. It's hard not to be a, a just a flat out optimist on this diet. And it's a good thing. It feels great. Get Maybe it's getting out and getting sun. Some people say it's a vitamin B that's in your body from being eating uh, carnivore and cutting out the vegetables that have a lot of anti-nutrients. I don't know what it is, but I do feel happier. I feel more optimistic and I'm motivated to do stuff all the time. And I'm always up just to go, to go do stuff. There was a time when I didn't want to go hiking. I did it because I knew it was good for me. Um, and while I was doing it, I enjoyed it, but not as much as I do now. Now it's so natural. It's just like, I want to go out and hike. I want to go do things. And uh, this guy here didn't. This guy on the left of your screen, he didn't want to get up off the couch. My couch is neglected now. My couch is something I reserve for a movie time with my son or a sports event. I watch hockey. So when a hockey game comes on, I'll sit on the couch. But I don't go on that couch. I do take naps on there sometimes because it's a nice, big, comfortable couch, a nice, big leather couch. And I am known for my naps in the Army. I used to call it getting a woman or a warrant officer mid-afternoon nap, which is an acronym for woman. So anyway, I used to get my, my woman sometimes, but it wouldn't be on the couch. It would be in the car. I'd go out in, in my unit and uh, go sit in the car and, and sleep for 15, 20 minutes and then get back out. So that's what I like, like a 15, 20 minute nap and I'm totally re-energized. <clears throat> and I do like that because I'm an early riser and I like to exercise. And then um, I might eat around 11 or 12 after that because I usually exercise in a fasted state. And then I might get a nap after that. And it's usually the best quality sleep for 15 or 20 minutes. And then I get up and I'm freaking energized. I feel like I could rip a telephone book in half. For those of you who remember that, because that's old do, old days, right? When you used to rip the telephone, the strong men used to rip the telephone books in half. And for those of you who don't know, a telephone book was actually literally a list of everyone's telephone number <laughs> in your city. And it was really freaking huge. Yeah, they actually had that. It was a book that you could actually, it was like that thick. And you can go through and find every business and every person that had a listed phone number in there. Can you imagine how we used to live? When our, when our phone was attached to the wall and you could pick up another line in the house and listen in on the call and you had to, you could only walk as far as your cord was. So there's usually one phone that had a really long cord, typically in the kitchen, I think for most people. And you could walk around the corner, go into a closet, close the doors, so you have privacy when you're talking. If you only had that one phone, sometimes people were lucky and had phones in their bedrooms. I know that was every teen girl's dream. So they could sit on the phone. And I think we were just talking about this other day. Dads would get mad because their daughter would be talking all day at school and then get home and talk on the phone with the same friends. It's like, didn't you just talk? I guess kids do it now with phones, cell phones, but I don't know. It just seems different. It was a different time. It was a great time to grow up. I had a great childhood. And like I said, we were lucky enough to eat more whole foods than kids today. Even when we did have salads. Okay, so my, we grew our own strawberries in the backyard. And my mom would buy lettuce. We'd have strawberries and we had walnut trees out front. So we'd go get walnuts. We'd get fresh walnuts. We'd get fresh strawberries. My mom would make a, a salad and she would make dressing with either oil and vinegar or she would make what's called buttermilk ranch because you couldn't buy ranch dressing back then. There's no, there, that didn't exist. So there were no seed oils really in the foods in the 70s and even in the early 80s. So she would get real buttermilk and then pour a season packet in there and make buttermilk ranch. And that was really just a buttermilk dressing. If you find value in my content and like my channel, please like and subscribe and click the notification bell so you see my new videos as soon as they come out. Also, please share this and other videos on social media, especially to veterans and first responders, who, as I say in many of my videos, are often suffering in silence. You never know who's hurting and a video like this might just turn someone around. So please go ahead and share it. And thanks for your viewership and your support. Dressing with seasoning. And uh, so that's a lot more whole foods than kids do now. And there was a lot less processed packaged foods. There were some chips and crackers, but those we didn't have all the time. And uh, pizza we might have had once a month. Maybe McDonald's once a month. We didn't go out all the time. We ate at home quite a bit. And now my mom did cook with some seed oil. She started using Crisco and stuff. 
And boy, that was terrible, I guess. So I, we did have some inflammation, I'm sure. But when you're young, your body just absorbs it and rebounds so fast. Even now, I think these kids are doing okay, but they're not unlocking their potential, right? And this diet is all about unlocking your potential. So let's go into that. Let's talk about, we talked about what happened to me. You know, uh, allergies went away, migraines went away, uh, arthritis went away. I'm sprinting again. I wasn't even able to run. These are things that happened. I lost about 50 pounds, put on amazing muscle mass, started lifting weights again. And this is something else, the motivation I talk about. You get motivated, you just feel like going out and doing some something. I feel like going out and walking or running or whatever. I just felt like joining the gym in December. And I thought, well, January 1st, I'm going to join the gym. You know, everyone does the January 1st thing. This is going to be my New Year's resolution, part of being carnivore. I'm joining the gym. And then remember like, December 6th, I'm like, why am I waiting to January 1st? I want to work out today. I do. I want to go hit the gym now. And that's the motivation. It just hits you. And you just feel like, man, just like when I, months ago, when I was like, I wonder if I can run. And I just felt like running that day. And I did it. I just went and joined the gym that day and started lifting. So I've been lifting since early December and my body's really responding. And these are the motivation things you get. So all these things change, right? The weight loss, the motivation, the mental outlook, everything's changed. So that was year one. Year one was a a year of healing, a year of discovery, a year of huge gains, a year of transforming from the guy on the left to the guy on the right, which is a completely different person. That's what year one was. So what's year two going to hold for me? So year two, I'm looking at optimizing my health. The eventual goal I'll be turning 58 May 4th. My eventual goal is to be in the best shape of my life at the age of 60. So I have two years to tune my body to get myself in better shape than when I was playing rugby uh, at Michigan State or lacrosse at LSU when I was playing lacrosse down there, which I was in fantastic shape. And I really want to get to the point where my body's just like, boom, uh, it's dialed in six pack abs again, just like really just dialed in and you can see i'm i'm already getting such great gains i know most of the gains i get in the beginning are going to be the most radical and as you approach your goal it slows down i really do want to optimize my physical health that's really what i want to do so that's my next goal is to not just be in great shape but just to be in the best shape of my life also another goal is to grow this channel and to reach more people with this message this positive message of health and healing and wellness, which is true for everyone who tries it. I'm not interested in arguing with people. I'm not interested in basically trying to convince people to do this. But when people decide they want to try something, I want to be here to support them, to cheer them on, to share information with them, to share my stories and my motivations and other people's too. I love to share other people's YouTube channels. If you haven't noticed, I do do that a lot on my live streams. And, you know, the thing is, not everyone's going to totally get on board with me or relate to me because I'm a different kind of person than a lot of other carnivores, like Carrie from Homestead How and Dante, two different kinds of carnivores for me completely. All motivated, all great results, all successful YouTubers, but just different. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. That means there's more people out there to, uh, to relate to. And maybe I do relate to you, but you'll have a friend who doesn't relate to me that'll relate to Carrie or to Dante or to one of these other guys. So, I mean, that's, that's the power of having this community and to also have these messages that are directly related from our experience, our individual experiences. And all of these individual experiences become data points. And each one is a one-off. So each one of our data points individually is not a proof. But when you get enough of these data points, then you actually get a body of evidence that point to a theory, right? So, you know, if I was the only person on the earth who had these results eating this way, you could say, well, that's a one-off. That guy's genetically that way. It's not, that doesn't work for humans in general. But when you look at people across different continents eating the same meal, uh, different cultures, ethnicities, all eating the same type of food and getting the exact same results, that becomes your theory, right? And this is the carnivore theory. 
is it proven? No, it's not proven. It's a theory and you have to prove it in yourself. So, you know, this is something you have to do on your own, but you don't have to do it by yourself. And what I mean by that is you have to make your own decisions, but you can be in community. And I recommend you are in community with others. Try to find leadership, try to find a cohort of companions who see the world the way you do and try to be positive and eat this way of eating and live this lifestyle. It's really a lifestyle. And the fact that it's a lifestyle, not just a way of eating, you know, is obvious when you get into the communities because it's a different way of living that really affects everything, especially in modern Western society. You're implementing an ancestral diet, tens and hundreds of thousands of years old into a modern lifestyle, which is not super easy, but it's completely doable. And some things that people find when they do this that surprises them is it's cheaper, it's easier, it's more simplified, but it's also hard socially because people, when they notice you stopped eating vegetables and fruit, for some reason they feel compelled to ask you when you're going to start eating them again, right? It's like, well, one, what is it of your business? Why do you care? These same people never cared when you ate pizza, cake, and donuts. And now all of a sudden, the fact that you're not eating vegetables, they're worried, right? Oh my, I'm worried he's not eating fiber. And it's like, really? So why were we not worried when I was eating garbage? And now you're worried. It just doesn't make sense. But, you know, we can be polite and just dismiss people, which is what I do. They're not going to live with the pain, the being overweight, the self-image damage of being out of shape and all these things that happen in your life because of e you're eating a terrible diet. If you try to do that, you, you can't please everybody. And I don't recommend you ever try. Please work on yourself, set your goals for you and disregard the comments from the peanut gallery. Just disregard them. And you can be polite. You don't have to like belittle them or argue with them. Just say, yeah, thanks for your advice, but I'm eating on an elimination diet recommended by a doctor. And it is, it's an elimination diet recommended by a lot of doctors, but you can tell them you're under a doctor's advisement that you're eating an elimination diet to treat medical conditions that you have. And that's completely factual. So that's what I do. And, or I just say, you know, I'm a carnivore, that's it. And I don't care. Whatever you say, whatever you think you do, you, I'm doing me. If you're interested, check out my channel. That's kind of the way I do it. If you're not, fantastic. Go live your life. It's so, so funny. People come in, they, they try to uh, attack us for living and eating the way we do. And I never understood that. Like before I was carnivore, I never had time or I never looked at other people that were and tried to attack what they were doing. And I don't understand people that do, but it may be because they don't have the mental clarity and the brain fog lifted. Maybe they feel threatened. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure but it's very tribal and you see these tribes of people attacking carnivores. I get it all the time on my channels and I don't care anymore. It doesn't really matter. They can live their life the way they want. I'm not going to try to convince them. Like I said, it's just the way it is. <clears throat> but anyway, so I've had a, a great ride so far. We'll put the picture back up because it makes me feel great that I'm, that I'm actually succeeding at this and doing so well. It just really, it just really is a, a blessing in my life. You know, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And it was so easy, so simple, right? It's not easy. It's simple. It is hard. And it's only hard in the beginning, though. So, guys, if you can gird your loins, and if you don't know what that is, it's a biblical term. Girding your loins means preparing for some hardship. If you can gird your loins and prepare for four to six weeks, would you go through four to six weeks of hardship to change your body like I've done in this picture, because that's really what it is. And it's not just your body. The body is the thing we all chase because that's what we see every day. It's things you don't even know. And the, I call it the unknown unknown, right? And what you don't know that you don't know. And once you go down this rabbit hole and you changed, the unknown unknowns are greater than the body change. The body change is fantastic. I do feel good. I like to take my shirt off now. I like to hit the gym and I like what I see in the mirror. I love when I'm working out. I love getting the pump again. It's just an amazing feeling. But the unknown unknowns that I encountered, the allergies going away, the mental health, the all the, the motivation, the positive outlook on life, lack of depression, lack of anxiety, all the things that changed, I like to call it carnivore zen. The carnivore zen came over me. 
and I'm better emotionally, spiritually, I'm better physically, I'm more patient. I'm just, I think I'm a better dad. I'm a better neighbor, a better person now than I was on the standard diet. I'm a better citizen. I think these are things you can do. Everything can be better. And I just think about, man, if we could roll this out nationwide, or as I like to say in, in the army in the platoon, to have a platoon of carnivores to compare to everyone else would have been awesome. That would be so cool. Any platoon leaders out there, let me know if, if I can help you do that because uh, that would be fun to see what you could do if you could get them to buy in. Or dang, even a squad. If you get a squad to buy in on carnivore and just see what they did. Uh, maybe make a squad with guys that are willing to be carnivores out of your platoon. That would be pretty awesome. By the way, from the military point of view, I'm reading some of my old books again. I'm reading this one, which is the three meter zone. Anyone that's been in the army probably knows this one. If you've been in leadership and they talk about different types of soldiers, they talk about the three meter soldiers, the 50 meter soldiers and the hundred meter soldiers. And basically it's, if you're in a blast zone of a, of an IED or an explosive device in the three meter zone, you're probably not going to survive in the 50 meter zone. You have much greater chance of survival in a hundred meter zone. You're basically good. You're pretty safe. Anyway, that was, that was the theory on this. And then you have your soldiers that are three meter soldiers that you're leading and the three meter soldiers take a lot of direct supervision to keep them safe, keep them from killing, as we used to say, keep them from murdering themselves, right? Because they're just like, like toddlers kind of, they just, they do the wrong thing at the wrong time. And then you got the 50 meter soldiers that kind of know what they're doing. They're pretty safe. You don't have to be as hands on with them. Even hundred meter soldiers are automated. They're just out there doing their job. You don't have to worry about them. And same with carnivore. I think this is a skill set where you have your three meter carnivores, your 50 meter carnivores, your hundred meter carnivores. When you start out, you're a three meter carnivore. You need a lot of supervision. You might be asking a lot of questions. You might be trying to figure out what carnivore diet, what an ancestral diet looks like in your modern life daily. And you might be asking questions like, hey, can I eat honey? Can I eat apples? I really like apples. I love pineapple. Can I eat it? That kind of stuff, right? That's a three meter question. And then you get to your 50 meter question where they're kind of figuring it out, right? And maybe they're asking a little more advanced questions like, hey, does coffee have oxalates in it? Should I be concerned? These kind of things you're getting to more where you're figuring things out. You're still asking some questions. You get to your hundred meter carnivores and they're like, they've got this figured out. They know their body. They understand their hunger signals. Now they're basically deep diving in, into more advanced things. And not that you have to, but they, a lot of them do like to like LDL cholesterol. And a lot of times it's to answer other people's questions too. It's like, okay, now I've got me fixed. I'm going to start answering some questions and find out. Is there a protein um, level I need to be eating? Is there a fat ratio? How do I figure out? Do we do macros? All kinds of stuff like that. <clears throat> you can go into that at the 100 meter zone, but you're pretty much on autopilot. Now you're just dialing things in. You might be adding something in, removing it just to see how it affects your body, that kind of stuff. Because everyone's body is different. Some people can tolerate a lot of things that others can't, and they may add things back into their diet. I've known people to add things like occasional sweet potatoes or occasional things back into their diet. Paul Saladino's had all kinds of crazy stuff. I wouldn't do any of the stuff he's doing as far as honey and uh, fruits. People will experiment and try things out. And what I find is that I totally intended on doing that when I started. At the first 30 days, I said, I'm going to give this thing 30 days hard. I'm going to see how it works. And then I'll probably start adding some things back in, right? So I did that. And after 30 days, it felt so good that I was like, I'm not adding anything in. In fact, I might even restrict it more and start dialing in. And after 90 days, I actually did lion diet for 30 days because I really felt amazing. And I thought, wow, I wonder if, if I do lion diet, then, you know, will it be even better? And it, it was pretty amazing. I lost 13 more pounds right away, especially in the beginning. It's pretty awesome. But you have these tools in your tool bag where you can add things and remove things to your diet. And that's what's great about this elimination diet, right? It is a great way of eating. It's a great tool. Lots of tools in the tool bag, lots of expert resources out there, lots of regular resources like me. I'm not an expert in anything, but I've just done it for a while. So there's a lot of resources out there. Carrie, like I said, Dante Fragno, there's a bunch of small YouTubers. I recommend you go regularly watch them, seek out new YouTubers, support them, like and subscribe, comment on their videos. And while you're at it, like and subscribe and comment on mine, please. I'm here putting this out and trying to get the algorithm to pick it up so that it will 
get me this message out to more people. Like I said, I, I saw this. It was offered up to me by the algorithm, this way of eating. And it was Dante Fregno's video, 127 Days of Lion, I think it was, or Carnivore. And I wasn't even looking for diet stuff. So that may be the only way someone hears about this. Although I think it's getting more and more popular. But uh, I think when they see regular people doing it, and not necessarily all doctors that are hyper fit, like <laughs> Dr. Baker, and Dr. Chafee, if I'd only seen those guys doing this, I'd be like, well, they're MDs and they're crazy fit. And they're like top athletes, world record holders, and uh, professional athletes and doctors. And they're like the one-offs. But when you see regular people doing it and getting awesome results, it is super encouraging. And anyway, so I think that's pretty much all I have to talk about today in my one-year carnivorsary. I just want to thank you guys for being on the ride with me. For those of you that join and support my channel, it means a lot. And it does help the algorithm get this out. We need to get this message out to as many people as we can. It is a life-saving message, in my opinion, especially when you talk about, you know, I mission carnivore and the you talk about the first responders and veterans who are suffering in silence, many of them, especially as you know, they get out of the service and a lot of them just feel lost. And I think this is a community that can help you not feel lost. And it's also um, a way of eating that can fix a lot of your mental issues, including decreasing anxiety levels, PTSD, all these things. It, it is pretty amazing. It's a, it's an amazing tool. So need to get it in people's hands, need to let them know, or at least be aware that this is an option. And the best thing about it is it costs no money. You don't need to buy an app. You don't have to buy any books. You don't have to buy special foods. It's just meat. It's cheaper than eating a regular diet. Once you get into it, your calories per weight or whatever you want to figure it out. If you look at chips and uh, granola bars, they're so expensive. If you look at how much nutrient you're getting per gram compared to meat, meat's so nutrient dense that it is the cheapest, best way to eat. So you want to save a bunch of money, you eat ground beef and eggs. I eat tons of eggs and ground beef and it saves so much money. It's ridiculous. And you never throw food away, which is great. But uh, anyway, so that's all I got today, guys. This has been my one year anniversary. Thanks for joining me. Stick around. Let's see where this thing goes. Let's keep driving it. Let's look forward to sharing with more people and making an impact on society and our neighbors. And all I got to say is stay strong and overcome. Carnivore Soldier out.